if you're just talking about someone who is training for strength, training for muscle mass, training for health and fitness, there is no argument that you could make that would convince me that sumo is of any use at all. I just don't see the argument for it. Hey everybody, Mike Matthews here from Muscle for Life and Legion Athletics. And in this episode, I speak with the grandfather of barbell training, Mark Ripito, who has given us many a great things, including books that everyone should read if you haven't read them already, Starting Strength and Practical Programming. Now, as you probably know, I am a fan of Mark's and I'm a fan of his work because nobody really has done more to promote, teach, and defend barbell training than good old Rip. And also because he has a peppery personality, which always makes for a fun conversation. And this time around, we talk about the deadlift and its many subtleties and many variations. Now, there are a number of factors that ultimately determine how well you can deadlift that are just out of your control, like your limb lengths, your bone structure, your height, and so forth. However, there are also many things that you can control, like your technique, your tools, and your training methods. And these are the things that you are going to learn about in today's podcast. So whether you are brand new to the deadlift or are simply trying to add a few more pounds to your powerlifting totals, I think you're gonna find today's talk helpful because in it, Mark and I discuss a number of common questions like should you sumo trap bar or conventional deadlift should you deadlift with a mixed grip hook grip or double overhand grip should you use straps should you use a belt can you round your upper back not your lower back but your upper back and what are some helpful cues for better deadlifting so the bottom line is by the end of this interview you are going to know more about the deadlift than probably 95 percent of the people in your gym, including the trainers. This is where I would normally plug a sponsor to pay the bills, but I'm not big on promoting stuff that I don't personally use and believe in. So instead, I'm just going to quickly tell you about something of mine, specifically my one-on-one coaching service. So the long story short here is this is the personal coaching service that I wish I had when I started in the gym many years ago. Every diet and training program that we create for clients is 100% custom. We provide daily workout logs and do weekly accountability calls. Our clients get priority email service and discounts on supplements, and the list goes on and on. Furthermore, my team and I have also worked with hundreds of people of all ages, circumstances, and needs and goals. So no matter how tricky you might think your situation is, I promise you we can figure out how to get you results. If I have piqued your interest and you want to learn more, then head on over to www.muscleforlife.com forward slash coaching and schedule your free consultation call now. I'll tell you, there's usually a wait list and new slots fill up very quickly. So if you're interested at all, don't wait. Go schedule your call now. All righty, that is enough shameless plugging for now at least. Let's get to the show. Mr. Mark Ripito, back again. Thanks for taking the time, my friend. Hi, Mike. Good to be here, man. Um, I still have abs. You don't. We can get that out of the way. It's fine with me. I, what do I do? With it? I'm 62. I don't care about abs. I'm actually jealous. You don't have to care. I, I actually do I, have to care. I don't care. You know, I, my belly doesn't seem to be growing very fast. And I just, I can still deadlift six, uh, 500 at the age of 62 though. So, you know, I just learned to be satisfied with that. That's pretty nice, actually. That's that's a good list. Well, that's that's the segue into today's talk. I wanted to pick your brain on the deadlift, on your favorite, on your favorite exercise. That is your favorite exercise, right? Well, it's. Uh, I don't know that I can. I don't really have a favorite exercise anymore. Really, I hate all of them. Uh, <laughs> I, I just happen to be have always been better at pulling the bar off the floor than when I was a competitor than any of the other lifts that. Uh, uh, were required of me as a power lifter. Never been a good bench presser. Do you have long arms? Uh, no, I'm of average anthropometry. I'm exactly who what you're supposed to look like to be a good power lifter, except that I just wasn't. 
but I've always been able to pull the bar off the floor. Now, the interesting thing about that really is that back in the 80s when I was competing, no one that I am aware of and that I was aware of at the time, certainly, and to this day, I've never run into a satisfying mechanical explanation of how the deadlift took place and what to actually do once you grab the bar to pull it off the floor more effectively. So I just went up to the bar and pulled on it without seeing the patterns. And as far as I know, we're about the only people that have ever actually analyzed the pull in all of its forms, the deadlift, the clean, the snatch, any other kind of pull, and determined what the mechanics of the most efficient pull were, were and therefore what the instructions for doing it the most correctly would be. I think we've gotten that down. And, uh, yeah, and for anybody listening, I'd say just pick up starting strength. If I don't think we need to get into the, all the details of, of that here. No, it's been hashed out pretty thoroughly in the book and on our videos and everything else. And it, it just, the 10 second version of it is the bar has to be over the middle of your foot and it has to go up in as vertical a line as you can make it go. And if you position your body to cause that to happen, then your deadlift will be efficient. If you don't position your body to cause that to happen, you are leaving pounds on the bar. Look it up. I mean, we've talked about it at length, and I think that uh, our analysis has yet to be refuted. I haven't seen a refutation of it anyway. Yeah, and and practically speaking, I mean, it works for everybody listening. That's all, that's all you need to get everything that you want to get out of the deadlift. With I mean, obviously, the caveat of of not letting your lower back uh, not don't do it like a scared cat, but yeah, don't do it wrong. Yeah, just doing it right is that's that's all you really need to know. Our instructions detail how to how to do it right, how to lift with your back and extension, how to position your feet, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, and for everybody listening again, you can just just check out um, starting strength or check out like Mark said. There's a lot of videos of uh, I, the art of manliness videos he did. I think are a good good just simple instructional videos. That's the best one we've done to date. We're working on a series of those that should be out very very soon here in a couple of months of our own, but Brett McKay has been kind enough to come down to Wichita Falls and, and shoot some videos with us. And those are right now the best of the instructional videos that we've got. So I'd refer you all to Art of Manliness website and Brett McKay's work over there is outstanding. And he's, you know, I'll tell you what, Mike, he has become a very good lifter. Hmm. He will deadlift 600 this year. Wow. That's impressive. Oh yeah. He's, uh, he got, to where he likes this quite a bit. And he, uh, at our meet this fall, Brett's going to pull 600. That's impressive. I'd say, I'd say any, any, anything over 500 impresses me. If I, if when you get into the fours, that's where it's like, okay, you're serious about it. But anything well, over five Everybody ought to be able to deadlift in the fours, you know. But yeah. uh, no, I agree. 500 is pretty good. 600 is, is strong. 700 is real strong. 800 is, you know, top 1%. Right. 900 just doesn't happen very much. 1,000 yeah, is... Weird. Super freak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about, uh, I, I think of um, Martin Burkhan as an example of this, but there are other people that, that have a lot of rounding in their upper back when they pull. Have, have you seen Burkhan's pull? No, but I've seen Konstantinov's pull and he does the same thing. A lot of uh, very good lifters have, have learned how to pull with that, uh, with a certain degree or at least tolerate a certain degree of thoracic flexion. And the reason for this is because it improves pulling mechanics quite substantially. It makes the pull easier. If you can come back at the top and actually lock the pull out at the top, according to the rules, and you know, lift the chest out of that thoracic flexion. But doing it that way is, uh, there's a very good reason for doing it that way. If you shorten the spinal segment by putting a curve in it, shortening the effective length of the moment arm between the hip and the gravity vector, the barbell, the lever you have to operate to pull the bar is shorter. It does several other things. It extends the knees. Your knees are in a more open angle. Your hips are, are in a more open angle. 
While the range of motion of the barbell remains the same, the pull off the floor starts in a much more mechanically advantageous position if you can do that. Now, we don't teach it that way because I'm not going to ever tell a novice to pull with any position other than absolute spinal extension. Normal anatomical position is the, is the safest way to load the spine. But if you're an 800-pound deadlifter, you've already made up your mind about that. It's our observation that a lot of people are, are naturally rather kyphotic and pull that way just as a matter of their default anatomical position. But if you can learn to not hurt yourself and pull with an upper back inflection, certainly not the lumbar, but the upper back inflection, it's to your mechanical advantage to do so. Yeah. And I, I've never personally messed with it because... Um, for the reasons that you just gave, uh, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to learn a new technique and, and have the risk of injury. And I, I'm not. I, I don't compete. I'm not. I don't live and die by my deadlift. And I've been happy with everything I've gotten out of it. Just sticking to the tried and true, more traditional approach. You know, it's one of those things that, that I get asked about here and there because people see. Um, in Burkan's case, I'd say he's probably my height. He's, he's probably around six feet tall, two ten. Uh, ish and lean as fuck and pulls like 700 for singles. So it's kind of absurd to even see. Um, and it's a, he, it's a mechanical trick that he's developed and a lot exactly. of, a lot yeah. of lifters, and a lot of people though, they're like, Oh, what the fuck is this? This is the most ridiculous shit ever. So I thought it'd be worth uh, bringing up. Yeah. He's a competitor. He's decided that it's more important to pull heavy weights than it is to uh, worry about spinal safety. And that's fine. That's what, competitive athletics is all about. If you're a competitive athlete, you long ago decided that winning was more important than safety or health or anything else. That's what it means to be a competitor, you know, but in terms of absolute spinal health, of course, we teach the pull in spinal extension, thoracic and lumbar extension. And for people listening, if you just imagine that as a neutral spine, like the standard, keep your spine in a neutral position. Yeah, whatever terminology you want to apply to that. Yeah, it's just lumbar, lordotic curve, thoracic, normal, kyphotic curve is regarded as a neutral spine or normal anatomical position. And that's how you ought to learn how to pull. Now, if you decide to go to the meat and you want to experiment with a little bit of flexion in your upper back, go right ahead. Don't be shocked when you hurt yourself, but uh, at that point, you're on your own, hun. What about sumo versus conventional versus trap bar? Well, the sumo deadlift is of more concern. The trap bar deadlift not a tra- is not a deadlift, but we'll speak about that in a minute. Sumo deadlifts are have infiltrated the... Uh, the, in, the grams, the, the Instagrams, it's gotten a lot of popularity. At least I've seen it over the last couple of years because you have some of these quote unquote influencers that just prefer to pull sumo. And then a lot of people thought like, oh, that's the cool thing or that's the better thing. Well, it's, it's not even that they prefer to pull sumo. They've been taught that that is a deadlift. You know, they're pretty good at ignoring the fact that all world record deadlifts, you know, with just a couple of exceptions have been pulled conventional. This thing started back about 1981, maybe 80. The first guy I remember pulling sumo and looking at the pictures of him doing this in Powerlifting USA was Mike Bridges. And I'll tell you, the day that the first sumo deadlift was pulled at an IPF world, there should have been Monday morning a technical rules committee meeting and that should have been nipped in the bud how come because it fixes it up so that certain anthropometries profoundly favored over others for example if you are a four foot nine inch female that that is what that's that's a coincidence because that's how i identified today so so you (laughs) well I'm proud of you, Mike. You, you're. Are you a mind reader? You admitted that in our interview here. That's great. Uh, so you, as a four nine female, decide you're going to to see how much you can deadlift. All right, you can take a stance that essentially is plate to plate wide. You take a grip with vertical arms in the middle of that, and you can get set up in your deadlift position and. All you basically have to do 
is barely straighten out your knees, barely straighten out your hips, and lift your chest, which is almost already lifted. You have pulled the bar about an inch, but that complies with the rules. And the rules should not allow that because that is a profoundly different movement pattern, a profoundly different pulling event than an actual deadlift by a person of normal stature. Hell, a person of normal stature doing a sumo pulls it further than that. Essentially, sumo is a trick to reduce the range of motion of the pull. And we talk about this quite a bit. It is possible to manipulate the effective length of a segment, legs, trunk, arms, all body segments. It's, imp- it's possible to effectively manipulate the effective length of those segments by manipulating angle. And what sumo is, is artificially short legs. Artificially short legs bring the hips closer to the bar. They place the knees almost in an extended position the hips almost extended. And for a very short person like that, you can deadlift by pulling the load one inch. Well, now that's not a hell of a lot of work, is it? Work being force times distance. Sure. But it complies with the rules. So what should have happened, the first time a sumo deadlift was tried, it should have been recognized for what it was, a hole in the technical rules. And the rules should have been changed right then, to state that the grip must always be taken outside the stance. And had they done that, then you would have the ability to accurately compare one performance against another, because everybody would be doing much more closely the same movement pattern if that rule were in place. For example, here's another application of this same thing. I saw a video this past weekend, one of these criminals that works for me dragged this up on the internet, showed me on her phone. (laughs) A very, very lightweight female is using an extremely, extremely wide grip bench. Now, the rule on the bench should have been fixed at about the same time, but nobody's bright enough to have figured out the hole in this. Rules state that 32 inches between the index fingers is the grip, and that's permissible. Well, if you're four or nine and a a hundred pound female, you can get an extremely wide grip on the bar. And the purpose of this, of course, is to reduce the range of motion. You've seen the videos of the... Yeah, yeah, where it looks like it's like a two, it's like a two inch. You're like, what? They barely even did, did it move? I don't even know if it moved. It, it moved. All she did is shrug because <laughs> her elbows are basically already extended. So it was just a shrug. The, move, the, the movement was a one inch range of motion. Well, this isn't a bench press. Everybody understands this. The way to fix that would have been to make the rule that when the bar touches the chest at the bottom of the range of motion, when the bar is in contact with the chest, the forearms must be vertical as seen from the back. Vertical. If you do that, everybody's moving the bar the same distance with respect to their anthropometry. But if you allow a wide, wide grip like that, effectively shortening the arm segment at the expense of the angle, then you've got a situation where, no, the heavyweight guys and this little bitty lightweight girl are not, in fact, doing the same thing. And their performances are not comparable. Right. In this particular video, the price to be paid for that wide, wide grip and that very, very increased moment arm between the shoulder and the grip on the bar was paid at complete fracture of the ulna and radius. (laughs) It just let go. Her hand stayed on the bar and the arm went out. It's the damnedest, most sickening thing you've ever seen in your life. I mean, the girls just using the rules, the way they're written, but this is stupid. This is stupid. And the sumo is stupid, but you've got a whole generation, two generations of high school power lifters that have been taught by their genius high school football coaches that a deadlift is a sumo deadlift. So, so how, how though, let's bring that to just, just the everyday person who, you know, they want to get strong they want to build muscle. They're not looking, they're not looking to compete 
What are your thoughts on, okay, so let's say, let's say you have long femurs. You're going to find, like me, I have long femurs. I have long arms though, so I get to offset a little bit of that. But conventional deadlifting is uh, is difficult. It's uh, my, my long femurs make it more difficult. My, li- my long arms offset the difficulty a little bit. But some people, you know, if you have long femurs and normal arms, you're going to find traditional pulling very difficult because of the extended range of motion, right? And then and then what about hip angle, right? So, you know, if, if your femurs attach, what, at around 135 degrees or so, you're going to probably find either way equally comfortable. But if you're more of a, if it's more of a 90 degree, 90 degree attachment, right, then, um, and these are things that, again, I guess I'm just going off of uh, my understanding of things. So I'm curious as to your thoughts, but sumo deadlifting probably be very uncomfortable for a person whose femur attaches more to 90 degree, but if it's more of an obtuse angle, they might find sumo deadlifting more comfortable. What are your thoughts? on if the person finds sumo more comfortable than conventional and is stronger in it. Well, what you're asking is, what are my thoughts on comfort? I think comfort is overrated in strength training. What are we trying to be, comfortable or stronger? Some people do pull stronger on sumo and some people... I I understand that. I understand that they pull more weight, but they're pulling more weight over a shorter range of motion. What is the work? The work is the force times the distance. And the fact that you are stronger over a shorter range of motion is not terribly surprising. A quarter squat is heavier than a full squat. Well, yeah, I mean, but the range of motion is not that much less. Sumo is a quarter squat version of a pull. Don't you think that's a little bit like you, I mean, the, the reduction range of motion is, I mean, it's not 75%. It's not fifty percent. I mean, I guess you could say the quarter squat is fifty percent minimally, right? Of if if you're gonna if you're gonna at least get to parallel. Well, I tell you what, you could make an argument that lifting heavier weights is better, but you'd have to make that argument that lifting heavier weights over a shorter range of motion is beneficial in terms of getting stronger. And I don't think you can make right. that case. We have been teaching these movements for twelve years. Every seminar, one or two a month. We have 30 people that we successfully teach to do a conventional deadlift in about 15 minutes. Every one of them with, can't think of any exceptions, any recent exceptions, every single one of them successfully completes a conventional deadlift. They learn it in a very short period of time because the instructions are very, very simple. And amazingly enough, despite Radical differences in anthropometry, which are observable to the coach as differences in the back angle as the bar comes off the floor. Despite that, all of them manage to successfully complete a conventional deadlift. It's not uncomfortable. It's easy to learn. Everybody is doing a comparable lift in terms of what it is that they're pulling and how far they're pulling it. I just don't see an advantage to doing a sumo. It is too easily abused. I don't see any advantage to doing a partial squat either. And uh, if, like you said earlier in this this sentence, we're just trying to get strong. We're not competing. We don't win with our deadlift unless we're a powerlifting competitor. And I see an argument for powerlifting competitor doing sumo, as long as the rules permit it, which they shouldn't. But if you're just talking about someone who is training for strength, training for muscle mass, training for health and fitness, there is no argument that you could make that would convince me that sumo is of any use at all. I just don't see the argument for it. If you don't have to do a sumo because of some really weird anthropometric situation that you might have, I don't see a case for it. In fact, we ran into a a lady several years ago. It's been a long time. She was probably the most interesting piece of anthropometry I've ever seen. Her femurs were four inches longer than her torso, and her tibias were the same length as her femurs. Now, this gal looked dynamite in a pair of heels and a short skirt, but I'm telling you that made for an extremely difficult setup in the deadlift because that much leg under that little bit of torso had her hips above her shoulders. No matter what we did, she could not perform a conventional deadlift. So we had her sumo. But in 12 years, she is the only person that we have run into that was built like that. So in other words, more than likely, that 
particular specialty of a snowflake is not going to walk into your gym. And there's no reason to teach sumo. If you don't know how to teach a conventional deadlift, then you're not a coach. Okay. It's the easiest thing to learn how to teach. And it's just not, uh, you need to learn how to teach it. Makes sense. Makes sense. What about trap bar? The trap bar is a squat with a bar in the hands. Okay. Elaborate. Because <laughs> okay. it's often, a trap bar is obviously, and sumo is sometimes, so, sumo is sometimes recommended because it's a little bit easier on the back because you're, you know, more of an upright position. And trap bar is also generally promoted as uh, friendlier to your lower back. And, and the reason it's both of these are promoted as friendlier to the lower back is because they both can be done with a more vertical back angle. I understand that. This is a fundamental misunderstanding of what a more horizontal back angle can do to your back. A more horizontal back angle makes your back stronger because the back muscles have more work to do. We don't want to avoid loading that group of muscles because what are we doing the deadlift for? Back strength, right? That's the point. So if you're going to avoid loading the back with your technique, well, then don't deadlift, right? Because it's supposed to be hard for the back, and you're supposed to learn how, as the lifter, to keep your back flat, tight, and under control. More importantly, you're supposed to learn how, as the coach, to facilitate a better position for your lifters. And if you don't know how to do that, you need to learn or you need to get a different job. You don't need to avoid the primary task of strengthening the back that the deadlift is intended to perform. As a general mechanical observation, I'm I'm not interested in making the movement easier on the lower back. I'm interested in making the back stronger. So I'm going to select the position that puts stress on the back so that the back can adapt to the stress, recover from the stress, and be stronger as a result. I mean, if we if we want to make everything easy, let's just bowl, okay? Bowling's hard, man. Murder. <laughs> I mean, it's murder. You've seen bowlers. All right, so, so let's, let's get back to our sumo versus sumo trap bar discussion. What do you do a sumo deadlift for? Well, you do it. I mean, it, it's not exclusively, obviously, to train your back. It's also a lower body exercise, but it's primarily a back right. exercise. And it's obviously a bit more quads because of the nature of it. Same thing with trap bar. I'd say, right. I mean, I, I, and I, that's why we squat. The, there's a profound difference between a trap bar deadlift and a sumo. I was just going to say conventional deadlifting also. I mean, obviously heavily involves, especially, I mean, I mean, I really start to feel it when I, when I'm doing higher rep, I never go above eight to 10, but eight to 10 rep deadlifting is the worst if you're at a high RPE, but you, I mean, it's all, you really start to feel it in your quads. It's, uh, there's a similarity. I mean, the conventional deadlift uses more quad for most people uses yeah. more quad than the sumo does. The sumo is just an easy way to do the deadlift by shortening the range of motion. Wouldn't the sumo use the quads more because of the mechanics of it? Because you're getting deeper on the conventional, which requires more hamstring activation, right? To get out. No, uh, a sumo deadlift starts with a more open knee angle. That's why you do the sumo deadlift. Right. You produce a more open knee angle because the effective length of the legs is shorter because you've changed the angle between the sagittal plane and where the foot is on the floor. You've changed that angle. You've made that angle more open, and you've therefore shortened the effective length of the legs. So the sumo is the easiest of the in, in terms of looking at all of the muscle groups involved in the pull is the easiest of these three. Right. You know, I'm just saying, I mean, uh, I've, I've just in terms of looking at research of mu- muscle activation, it's a generally accepted thing, I guess. Uh, I mean, just throwing it out there that you, got, you have more quad activation in the sumo than the than the conventional. I don't believe that at all. You have more quad activation in the movement that operates the knee over the longer range of motion. Fair enough. Show me this here just as an aside. Would somebody please show me the study that demonstrates conclusively that surface EMG is an accurate proxy for motor unit recruitment. Right. No, I know. That's another discussion. I've I've had it. Yeah, no, I understand. I've spoken with, I think it was Eric Helms or Greg Knuckles about that. I mean, um, it's not completely worthless, but you can't, you can't Uh, take it as uh, worthless. I think it's used a lot because people in ex phys departments have the equipment. You tend to use for studies, the equipment you've got. right? Right. Right. You, you employ it. If you've got a bunch of creatine lab equipment, well, you do tend to do creatine studies. 
Each dollar is ten. So when all when all you have is a hammer, man, everything is a nail. That's absolutely true. So if you've got a, a trap bar, I may have explained my position on sumo, but look at the trap bar. One of the things about the trap bar is that it allows you to take a grip on the trap bar. It doesn't, by the way, allow you to adjust the width of that grip. It allows you to take a grip on the trap bar, squat down with your hips, and basically squat the bar up off the ground. Okay. Now, let's compare that to the deadlift, where the bar is in contact with your shins and your thighs all the way from the floor to the lockout. At the top and during the range of motion of that exercise, which of those two is the most stable and the least likely to hurt your back? Now, that's a valid point. That's something that I personally don't like about the trap bar deadlift is that you have to pay attention at the top because just that exact point. You're very stable in the conventional. Um, you're and, locked and- into a top of a deadlift. The bar is in front of your thighs and you're leaning back. And that thing, if your knees and hips are extended, you're stable. At the top of a trap bar deadlift, that thing can swing anywhere it wants to swing. And if you're using enough weight to actually have the thing constitute a a strength increase, a stress that produces a strength increase, you know, I don't think that that's necessarily a good idea. I mean, listen, what do you, I mean, why don't you just deadlift? You know, what is the, what does the trap bar do that a barbell does not, that we have to have done? What would you say, though, to the person? And I, and I agree. I mean, if you can pull conventionally without any issues, if you don't have any pre-existing injuries or anything, you can pull. I, I much prefer the conventional pull, and I just have always stuck to it. Um, but what would you say to somebody, though, who, let's say, because of some pre-existing condition, if the, if conventional pulling causes them discomfort or, or pain, and they would like to deadlift, but they need to find a workaround, and it's not because of how their body is built; it's because of a of an injury or something is wrong. You know, well, for the reasons I just stated, if you've got back trouble, the last thing you want to do is a trap bar deadlift. The very last thing you should subject your back to is a, is a trap bar deadlift because it's unstable. All right, now right. that's one point number one. Point number two, and this is a this addresses a larger situation. All right. Back pain is an interesting thing. Back pain in human beings is essentially, essentially ubiquitous. Every human being after the age of probably 25 and most of us before that point has had back pain. All of us have had back pain. By the time every human being is over the age of 30, an MRI study will show some degenerative spinal changes. All of them, 100% of the human race after the age of 30 has some changes that could be considered degenerative in their spine. All of us. So what's normal? Normal is that. Back pain is normal. Okay. And the hard part for people to swallow, the hard part for doctors to understand is that if you have back discomfort, Loading the back with a deadlift in proper anatomical position, the position we spoke of earlier, does not hurt the back. It makes the pain go away. We have people, and in fact, I'll make a blanket statement here, and I'll say that everyone who does not train that has chronic back pain will find at least some significant decrease in back pain after three weeks of squats and deadlifts. It's too universal, the report, to ignore. You, you, you're familiar with this as well. And here's the other, the, the corollary to that is that if you are an experienced lifter and, and you hurt your back, then that is no reason to stop squatting or deadlifting. The vast, vast majority of back pain does not involve neurological symptoms. It's local back pain. And if you don't have numbness, or tingling down a leg. You just have local back pain. Guys, I'm sorry, you just got trained through it. Take a bunch of ibuprofen, drop the load a little bit, take your reps up a little bit, and train through it. It it will get better in a week. It always does. And, uh, I mean, you look at the statistical averages, back pain events are about four weeks long. They resolve themselves in the same period of time, whether you do therapy or not, whether you go to the chiropractor or not, whether you train or not. 
That's just what they do. And if you understand this, then you're going to understand that there is no point in having a weak back. If you got back pain, would you rather have a painful weak back or a painful strong back? That's fairly obvious, I think. Maybe depends how much uh, soy is in your diet. Could be. Depends on your estrogen supplementation, possibly. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, of course, that makes sense. I mean, in the case of a, of a true disc injury, I mean, that's a whole other thing, mm-hmm. obviously. Yeah, but um, that's, but, that's but, like yeah. 5% of all reported back pain sure. involves an I know. actual yeah, yeah. neurological problem. If you got a disc injury, and you know what the funny thing about that is, disc injuries resolve, too. They just take long. A disc injury resolves it, it will heal up. Numbness, tingling, loss of motor control, that heals up too if you train. It just takes longer and it's way, way, way more scary. But, and the numbers on back surgery are also quite revealing here. Roughly speaking, one third of all back surgery is successful, one third of all back surgery does absolutely nothing. And one third of all back surgery makes the situation worse. In other words, two thirds of all back surgery accomplish nothing or make the thing worse. I would almost, I would almost rather they give me a sham, like a placebo surgery in hopes, you know what I mean? Just a fake surgery where I think I got a surgery. Like I'd prefer that. I don't know how they got that through human subjects, but they've done that. They've done this. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's really, really interesting research. Yeah. It's an interesting phenomenon that the mind controls pain. But this this goes back to the greater topic, what is pain? Pain is is your perception of a certain set of inputs. It's your perception of a certain set of inputs. For example, fibromyalgia is probably a situation where a person is a hypersensitive to the same inputs that you and I receive on a daily basis and we just ignore yeah, uh, the the perception of pain has a lot to do with the nature and the severity of that pain. If your leg has been hurting for thirty years a little bit, you don't pay any attention to it anymore. It doesn't keep you awake at night. You don't perceive it as pain. But to someone who has just acquired that sensation and hadn't gotten used to it yet, they're in agony. This is one of the most beneficial aspects of training with back pain. It teaches you that this unpleasant situation, the unpleasant sensation that you're being subjected to is not necessarily the end of the world and you can deal with it and you can pick up that box in the garage without hurting yourself and you can get a stronger back and the fact that it hurts a little bit while you're doing it is is irrelevant we have to stop pandering to people's perceptions of pain we want to hear about the nation's opioid crisis all of a sudden it's a big deal in the news just like you know everything else becomes a big deal in the news what do you suppose the uh, the reason for the nation's opioid crisis might be. The most frequently reported source of pain is back pain. You go to the doctor and with back pain and he writes you a script for hydrocodone? Well, that's stupid. That's just absolutely stupid. Fixing the source of chronic pain and teaching that the pain is you can deal with it is a much better idea than writing a bunch of prescriptions for opioids. Opioids, I've never had a problem with it because they don't work on me anyway. You know? No money in your idea, though, man. No, oh, no, you're certainly right about that. Pharmaceutical companies don't manufacture barbells. You know, it's probably a good idea that they don't, but. They would cost $10,000 $10, a barbell if they did. Exactly. But hey, but insurance pays for them. <laughs> the, uh, this whole thing with deadlifts, Mike, this is an extremely important topic. The, the whole thing with deadlifts is an extremely important topic precisely because of the way it relates to back pain in adult populations. We could solve so many problems if people would just quit worrying about their back hurting, pick the barbell up, three or four workouts in a row, and then realize that, hey, my back's not hurting anymore. Isn't it amazing that I've been in pain for three years without stop? I've deadlifted four workouts and my back would hurt. You know how many, 90% of chronic back pain will respond precisely that way. The other 10% won't get any worse. But your perception of well-being goes up because you're stronger. 
Uh, sumos, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a distraction. The trap bar deadlift is just a thing that's manufactured to sell. It's of absolutely no value to anybody, anywhere, anytime. It's unfortunate that the military has decided to incorporate it into a strength program. Uh, they were just sold the product by the manufacturer. A barbell is all you need to do. A barbell is more stable. It works better. And it is not going to hurt you at the top. So basically, the uh, the trap bar deadlift is basically in existence just to use a piece of unnecessary equipment. Uh, I see absolutely no advantage over the uh, standard barbell deadlift, and I see an otherwise useless additional piece of equipment laying around in the gym. I mean, for all the reasons we've discussed, it's just not elegant, and I see no point in it. All right. Let's talk grip. Mixed grip versus hook grip versus double overhand or even straps? What are your thoughts? The, the, the grip is a fairly interesting question because if you analyze heavy deadlifts, you look at lots and lots of heavy deadlifts, what you see in an overwhelming majority of big deadlifts is that during the pull, the bar will rotate away from the supine grip in a mixed grip or what I call alternate grip deadlift. The alternate grip is obviously used because it's more secure. Uh, if you're peeling out of the fingers on one hand, you're rolling into the fingers on the other hand, and you can hold up a hell of a lot more weight. But the price to be paid for that is uh, this little slight rotation that you see in almost every heavy deadlift where the guy's got enough weight on the bar to where he's mind is not functioning well enough to remember to hold that supine elbow back. You can learn to do it, but you still see this very, very frequently as an artifact of the supine side grip. Now, I haven't figured out exactly what causes that. And and just for people uh, listening, the supine would be the palm up, right? Palm forward is supine palm down is prone yeah so so just people i want to make sure people understand so that's like when you're and just actually just just to clarify the mixed grip just in case anybody's not familiar with it uh instead of the double overhand where both your palms are facing down the mixed is where one palm is facing up as if you were going to curl the barbell and the other one is facing down as if you were going to pull it and uh, like like mark was saying it, it just locks the barbell in place better so it doesn't roll out of your hands and as anybody who's deadlifted at all has experience once the bar starts rolling out of your hands it's like the whole lift shuts down yes the pull shuts down because your back as it turns out will not pull off the floor something that your hands are unable to hold on to it's a real weird phenomenon a lot of times we'll see somebody stop during the the part of a pull and set the bar back down. And what actually happened was the thing was not so heavy they couldn't pull it. They could have pulled it with straps or with an, with an alternate grip. But if the fingers start to open up, the back, there's a feedback loop and the back shuts the pull now. With an alternate grip, what you've got is a situation where one shoulder is in internal rotation and the other shoulder is in external rotation. And this difference between rotational positions of the shoulder is an asymmetry. It stresses each of those shoulders differently. And I prefer that when I'm coaching, especially new lifters, that I'd like to keep all the stresses symmetrical. So I always encourage people to lift with a double overhand grip uh, up as heavy as they can and then learn to hook grip which is a grip that produces a much more secure grip because of friction between the thumb and the middle finger instead of just the squeeze that you have to generate with a plain open overhand a uh, double overhand grip again the alternate grip is that which is most frequently used in competition by most people, but I've seen, uh, we. You, in fact, we use a video in our seminar, Brad Gillingham, deadlifting 400 kilos with a double overhand hook grip. So it can be done. Ugh. You, his, his thumbs you, his thumbs barely work, though. Well, <laughs> like his thumbs now. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it, it does hurt. You just got to mind, you just got to not mind that it hurts. 
and you can learn that. But you know, I think yeah, the guy can I still. I would say if you're a, what, what about if you're like a, what if you're a soy boy though, like me, and uh, it hurts a lot. What do you do then? Well, just, that's actually hook. That's my complaint with hook is it's fucking painful. Well, just re- and that's not re- even that much weight. Well, like right? it, just reduce your estrogen consumption. Yeah, I but mean, then, you know, get your ovarian and no one's gonna, and no moved one, and, and stop no, being a weenie. I mean, you can do. But then no one's going to like me. Then no one will uh, accept me. I won't I, be. I think you're underestimating. I won't be part of the trendy crowd. Uh, you need to. All right. So anyway, if you have got a double overhand hook grip, you're, all, you're probably at least as secure as you are with a, uh, especially with practice, with an alternate grip. The problem with the alternate grip is that. It produces, since it is two different positions of of humeral rotation, it produces different amounts of tension in the lat, all right? Because the lat insertion is medial, anterior, and proximal. If you rotate one forearm and humerus out and you rotate the other one in, uh, your lat is in a different position of, of stretch, and this may have something to do with the observed phenomenon of the bar drifting forward away from the supine side. It could have something to do with bicep tension on that side. Uh, what we do see is that almost every time, and, and without any exceptions that I'm familiar with, all bicep tendon injuries occur on the supine side of an alternate gripped deadlift. So if you're, in fact, a buddy of mine, Andy Baker, the uh, my co-author with uh, in, in Practical Programming for Strength Training 3rd Edition and the co-author of uh, the Barbell Prescription, just ruptured his distal bicep tendon a couple of weeks ago doing speed deadlifts, ruptured his supine side distally. It's hard to think of everything you need to think about when, when you're trying to do fast deadlifts off the floor. That's one of the reasons I'd rather have people clean. I don't see explosive deadlifts as being particularly useful, especially not if you can clean. And I mean, I'll, I'll weigh in on that, that I had some biceps tendonitis a year ago or so, and I, I was mixed gripping for a while. And um, it, for what it's worth, it was on the supine side and I, it didn't, it didn't turn into anything serious because I backed off and got some physical therapy and just kind of let it, let it in the end, just let it heal and stop doing things that pissed it off. Right. But if you're not going to go to a meet, you're not a competitive power lifter and you don't need to do heavy uh, you want to pull heavy, but you don't wish to do heavy alternate grip. And you don't want to do a hook because it just hurts too fucking bad on your thumb. Then just strap. Just strap. It doesn't make as long as you're doing all of your warm-ups with a plain open double overhand grip, you're getting all of the all of the grip strength effects that you need out of the deadlift. And you do not risk uh, I, you don't want that surgery if you don't have to have it, you know? Yeah. I mean, that, that's what I do now. I double overhand until it gets too heavy. Um, once I get into the mid threes, I just, I can't, I just don't have the grip for it. So then I strap. Yeah, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. Great. So that's simple. What about um, deadlifting shoes? Well, this is probably the thing that more. Or, or, or even, or even barefoot or, you know, wearing shoes, not wearing shoes, what shoes to wear if you're going to wear shoes. Okay. Well, you ought to wear shoes. All right. It's fashionable, especially since the functional training people who don't generally deadlift more than two and a quarter anyway, have uh, injected their brilliant observations into the conversation here that you're supposed to deadlift barefoot because that's more natural. Why well, it's more natural to deadlift that's barefoot. How, well, that, I mean, that's how cavemen deadlifted, so. Well, yeah, that's how cavemen deadlifted. Absolutely. <laughs> the brontosaurus bones. Where did they get the revolving sleeve barbells and plates? is a subject left for archaeologists to uh, explore further. But the simple fact of the matter is, is you've got one pair of feet, and I'm in favor of protecting your feet while you do heavy weights on the deadlift to get strong. I want you to have a nice, hard sole against the floor. I want there to be a metatarsal strap and an arch support to stabilize your foot so that you have the same pair of feet stay healthy for a long period of time. I don't see any any advantage in deadlifting barefoot. Okay, it reduces the range of motion a half inch. But hey, you're only deadlifting two and a quarter anyway. What do you care about that? 
It makes more sense to me to have a much more efficient interface between your foot and the floor than that provided by just the skin or the silly ass Vibram five finger idiot ass looking things that people insist Stinky on wearing. Too. Sometimes. Stinky. Oh God. Idiot. Oh my God. So yeah, I think you need some. Well, what are your thoughts gym. on what are your thoughts on a on a on a traditional? Like I have um, my normal, just regular gym shoes are Innovate. Uh, I don't know the. I'm not getting paid to say it, so I don't know exactly what they are, but I like them because they're they they don't fall apart and they have a hard flat sole. And that's actually usually what I a what hard I, flat sole with an arch support is exactly what you want for every lift you perform standing on your feet for squats, presses, deadlifts, cleans, and snatches. You want a hard, flat sole. I mean, I'll say, though, I particularly, and of course, yeah, I mean, that goes without saying, um, but I particularly have noticed, like, I like to squat in in squat shoes. Like, it makes a difference. I can't say I've quite noticed a difference in deadlifting, though. Is that just because I didn't notice or I wasn't doing something right? Or? Well, I think you probably just didn't notice. But, for example, I set my biggest PRs in my squat shoes with a little bit huh. of heel. I deadlifted 633, a couple of different meets in my squat shoes with a little heel. I used to pull in wrestling shoes and I changed over to squat shoes and I didn't notice a, a great huge difference. Although I will say that I think for people of normal anthropometry, that a little bit of heel adds to your ability to start the movement off the floor with a knee extension. It adds a couple of degrees of knee flexion and gives you a little bit more access to quad as you push the barbell away from the floor. That is, if you know how to pull correctly. The initial part of a deadlift is a push. And I think a little bit of heel aids in that. Now, that being said, if your anthropometry is weird, for example, you've got long femurs relative, like you do, long femurs relative to your shins, as you mentioned earlier. I think for you, a flat shoe would be a real good option because you've already got knee angle provided by the long femur. You might pull better in a flat shoe. And what I'd like to see available, but I don't know that one is, is a well-constructed shoe with a good art support that has an actual zero net heel to it. If I had my way, I would be able to buy a weightlifting shoe with no net heel, with a half inch net heel, and a three-quarter net heel. I don't think anything higher than that is of any use. But that's what I would like to see available, and there's not anything like that right now. Yeah, and my, that's that's why I've just uh, what I've found, and I'm just going off of. I notice a difference in my squats. I'm stabler. I can generate more torque. It's I, I just do better in squat shoes. Didn't notice that in depth, and that that's probably why it's just because of the the mechanics of it. Right, that's what it is. Everybody squats more weight in squat shoes. Everybody benefits from a hard sole a tight lateral and front to back stability provided by a good heavy metatarsal strapped squat shoe. Everybody does. We started enough people on this to where we know people show up at the seminar and they're running shoes and they try to squat the first three or four sets in these essentially almost fall over lace on mattresses. <laughs> they, they fall over and we, you know, I'll, I'll come up and say, look, there is a, uh, the gym owner here is going to let you borrow a pair of 10 and a half shoes. Go put them on right now. But, 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 but shut up and go put the shoes on. All right. They go put the shoes on, they come back and all their form errors are gone. It's just that simple. And, and all of a sudden they're, you know, they can add, uh, they, they up the weight by 30% and actually squat it. Yeah. Instability, believe it or not, instability holds you back in a squat. It's a, a thing you have to fight. And if the shoes help, you need a pair of shoes. Okay. This silly, ridiculous analysis. Of, well, it's not natural to wear weightlifting shoes. Well, it's not natural. Is that actually a thing? Do people I've, I've say heard that? It, I've heard it from CrossFitters and functional training people. Oh my God, they're just so stupid. Where does it stop? You know, if, if the only thing we get to lift is the naked feet in which we are born, then what are we going to pick up? Rocks, sticks. I, you can't use a bucket because buckets aren't natural. You can't load a bucket up with rocks. You have to pick up individual rocks. Here's the next fad, man. This is it. It's coming. <laughs>
that kind of thing. But you know, the the funny thing about it might might do well like in like in the doomsday. There might be a doomsday prep overlay there where you can. It's gonna be the these gonna be the gyms of our dystopian future. Where it's gonna be like lifting rocks and and uh, nuclear scorched earth and shit. Well, if, if the funny thing about training is that if you cannot incrementally increase the load in a way that allows you to continually get stronger week after week, month after month, you're not really training. You're just exercising. You're just fucking around. So the incrementally loaded barbell is kind of central to the idea. Uh, since we've we all seem to understand that. What's the problem with shoes? I, you know, you use the tools that, enla- that enable your training to proceed most efficiently. And shoes are one of those tools. So I don't want to hear all that shit. Okay. Just you guys yeah, get yeah, some that's shoes. Something. That's, that's, news. that's news to me. But yeah, no, I, I fully endorse shoes. I, re- I recommend my website. I mean, I like, I like Adidas' shoes personally, but there are obviously lots of options out there. Uh, what about belts? What about a belt? Well, I've got a big, long article on belt mechanics that explains hoop tension and the primary function of the belt, which is to increase the function of the Valsalva maneuver, your big held breath, to increase spinal stability. Uh, The increase in spinal stability enables you to lift more weight. It does not shut down. And I know you've heard this, too. Wearing a belt shuts down the abs. Who said that? Someone who's never deadlifted? Do you, do you not understand that under a 600-pound deadlift, there aren't any muscles that are shut down? What is wrong with you? You know, the, the belt gives you something to push harder against. Now, and, and if you're really interested in that argument, my article, The Belt and the Deadlift, is available on my website, startingstrength.com, under the articles section. But Here's the critical point about the deadlift, in my opinion, and it's been my experience since I've been thinking about this a little bit harder for the past several years. I'm really of the opinion that very, very few people have any business deadlifting in a four inch belt. I think a three inch belt is a much more efficient belt for most people of normal height. Now, if you're six, five, sure, four inch belts probably going to work for you because your waist is commensurately long. But for most people, a three-inch belt allows you to get a much better setup at the bottom start position of a deadlift than a four-inch belt. And the reason for that is the four-inch belt, it's so wide, it touches you at the top of the hip flexors. This is a bit of inefficient proprioceptive feedback in that it may tell you, that contact may tell you that your low back is fully squeezed into the arch that we talked about earlier. When in fact, it's not. When in fact, it is a little bit still in flexion. In other words, you don't want to have to fight the belt for an efficient start position. So, I mean, in that way, it could could encourage poor form then if you weren't cognizant of what's going on. Absolutely. A three-inch belt is plenty of width for good support. I mean, I'll add to that as well. A lot of people think that wearing a belt somehow magically protects you against injury. And so if you combine both of those things, that that, that can be a recipe for, for getting hurt. Walmart thinks that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all the silly-ass people wandering around in these fabric belts. It's just a costume, I think. I don't really understand it. But if you've got you got a belt on and the belt is actively resisting your best efforts to get into a position of lumbar spinal extension for your first pull off the floor, that's that belt is not productive. It's not helping anything and it's going to get you hurt. Most people don't need a four inch belt. In reality, most people need a three inch belt for all of their lifts. Most people. But this is one of these things that's just embedded in the equipment culture that all belts are four inch. Well, that's all. Everything is not everything. There are reasons to examine this. There are reasons to examine your choice of a belt. And I think if you'll think about it real hard, a three inch belt for most people makes much more sense than a four inch belt. Makes sense to me. I mean, I, I have always used a three inch belt personally. Uh, I've used it. I've used it pulling, overhead pressing, squatting, standard stuff, and I found it most. At least I noticed the effects most with squatting for whatever reason. But these days, I actually don't even use one because I'm of the mindset and very much in alignment with what you're saying. I've written about this as well. It's clear that you can lift more weight with a belt, but I don't know if that necessarily means you should always train with a belt. And that's um, at least at least in my case, I guess, because I'm not competing and I don't have a reason. 
season. I mean, I, I know my form and it's not that I'm afraid of getting hurt, but I just don't notice that big of a difference. And so how it started was I left my belt at the gym, like I lost it, unfortunately. And then I just never bought another one. <laughs> I'm in the same boat with you in terms of competition and stuff. But let me, let me say this. If you take your squat up to 315 without a belt, and then you put a belt on and you train for another year and get your squat up to 515, what do you think happened to your unbelted squat? Well, it went up too, okay, because everything gets stronger. So what we always recommend is that you do all of your warm-ups up to the last warm-up before the work set without a belt. So you're getting unbelted work. You put the belt on for the last warm-up because you need to experience before the work set all of the conditions that are going to occur during the work set. And then you do your work weight with a belt on. Now, that being said, if you've ever hurt your back, if you've got a chronic back injury, and you know, probably half of lifters do, then I'd put the belt on at 135, you know, because I, what point is there in costing yourself a couple of workouts with a back tweak that a belt could have prevented? So as a general rule, what we recommend is that the belt is an extremely important part of pulling off the floor, just like shoes and a barbell are, but you use it correctly. And for it very well may be that a four inch belt cannot be used correctly. So I'm just asking your listeners here to give that some thought. Yeah, no, I think it's a very reasonable position, reasonable recommendation. Again, the reason why I stopped using it was, I guess, more out of just, uh, I mean, I, I could say laziness, but I guess it's, you're not exactly lazy if you're squatting and deadlifting every week, but it, <laughs> just, just out of, again, I, I, had, I was using it for a, for a bit left in the gym and then just never got around to ordering another one. I was like, yeah, I'll just keep going without a belt. But uh, I think it is very reasonable to, uh, to use a belt every time you squat and deadlift, um, it's, I, I just, I can't be a hypocrite and say that I'm doing that right now because I'm not, I'm still squatting and deadlifting, but I'm doing it beltless right now. Oh, I don't see anything wrong with that every once in a while. I just don't hurt your back, Mike. Fortunately, I've not, the only injury of sorts that I've, uh, and it wasn't, I, I mean, it, it, it caused some pain for, I don't know, two weeks was, uh, an SI joint. Like it was weird. I was pulling, it wasn't even that heavy. It was mid fours and felt good, felt strong at the top of a set. I felt like my hips shifted a little bit and I was like, huh, that didn't feel right. Um, and it wasn't any pain initially. And, and then, and then there was some stiffness. You feel a movement. And then over the next two or three hours, the, it gets worse and worse. And finally, you know, it hurts. Yeah, then it didn't feel so good. And actually, so after I was like, okay, there was no acute pain. So I was like, that's kind of, now I feel kind of stiff. So I dropped the weight down to 315. And I was like, ah, I'm going to finish a couple sets. I'm not just going to leave. Um, and so I did that and those weren't really painful per se. But then an hour or two later, I was like, yeah, that doesn't feel good. You know, had some tingling in my leg and I was like, yeah, that's not good. And then over a couple of weeks, I didn't know, it was, it a, was this a disc issue or whatever? And I ended up uh, seeing a physical therapist and in the end, it, you know, it was SI joint. So I've, I've experienced that but that was on it that was with a belt and it was a weird like freak i was it was solid form everything felt good felt stable for some reason at the top though i, I don't know it just something something wasn't right and um it shifted a little bit on me and not enough to like become a huge injury but it was one of those things i was like well fuck i don't even know what i did wrong well sometimes it's not always possible to say exactly what caused an injury some days you may be perfectly warm in pretty good form. Everything looks like it did the last workout and something just moves. And it's just not always possible to say what happened. I wish it were, but it's not. Yep. And it was also one of those things where it's not even, you know, I understand if you're, if you're doing like a true one RM test or you're, or you're doing a rep max test, but not even, it was just a working set felt solid, but then, you know, whatever. Well, if, but, you're, um, if you're doing a test or a performance, then you do that with the understanding that, hey, there's a certain amount of, of risk here in, in seeing where the limits are. I, I tell you what, we ought to talk about on one of these uh, podcasts that we so enjoy doing with each other is, uh, is the difference, is our little two-factor model of the things that go into performance. Because I think it's a real useful way to think about the training and practice elements of uh, a performance and what exactly is performance 
what exactly constitutes training, what constitutes practice, the difference in, uh, in the two. This is an interesting thing that occurred to me during the seminar this past weekend. What is the difference between a game and a sport? Well, I think it's obvious that in a game like golf, a game like billiards, something like that that is clearly regarded as a game, there's not really a training component to the performance. There is only practice. But a sport, baseball, football, track events, throwing events, not only must there be practice for the actual skill involved in the execution of the movement pattern in the performance, but there's a training component too, a general physiologic adaptation that prepares you to, to more effectively do the do your best during performance day. And that's a that's an interesting topic. I think that uh, our little paradigm that we've come up with on that explains a lot of things and helps with ordering your thinking about how to prepare for an event. Sounds interesting. I'm, yeah, I'd be game. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, those are our, actually all the questions I had for you. Um, I had bands and chains here on there, but I mean, yeah. I know what your answer is. Yeah, you know what I and, think about bands. I, I, yeah, and, and, and very few people actually even mess with that stuff. So I thought that it was probably not necessary. Um, it applies to eight or ten competitive power lifters, and that's about it. Yeah. And every high school in the United States that's using bands and chains for their fifteen-year-old kids, those coaches ought to be fired jailed and executed because that's malpractice. Very fascist of you. In fact. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for, for anybody wondering, if there's just, uh, and the, the reality is there is no place for everybody listening for, for me, for me as well. And for every single person listening, it's just, it's not necessary. It's an added complication. That's not going to do anything for you. Except maybe get you hurt real bad. Yeah. Well, there's that. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, um, let's wrap up with, uh, of course, where can people find you in your work? Do you have anything in particular that you want people to know about that is uh, time sensitive? This will be coming out in the next couple of weeks or so. So if there's something, is there some June stuff that's uh, that you'd like to let people know about or projects on the, on the whole that are coming up? Well, we've got uh, permanent all day, 24 hour availability at startingstrength.com. Great big website, new articles up every day of the week, brand new content, at about noon every day, something new to read every day. Big active forum session. I'm available there. In June, we have a seminar in Wichita Falls at Wichita Falls Athletic Club. We just got through in early April with our first Strength Con, which was a, basically a meetup for people that read the website or fans of the method. 200 people showed up. We had a great weekend. And we're going to be repeating that in the middle of October, StrengthCon 2, with the injury rehab theme being the, uh, the general theme of the weekend's presentations. There will be workouts available. You get to train with everybody. And we have uh, social events planned. We have a whiskey tasting. We have a we have a bar Friday and Saturday night. We cater dinner Saturday night. It's just a lot of fun. Everybody was there had a lot of fun. And uh, uh, got a great little jazz band on Saturday night. We just uh, would invite everybody that's interested to check that out. It's on the events page of our website at startingstrength.com. And that's about all I got, Mike. Appreciate you having me on, man. And always enjoy our little discussions, even though you have abs. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, AIDS abs in your in your. <laughs> yeah, I think, I <laughs> you say it like that. Okay. Even though I'm afflicted, <laughs> I'm afflicted. I'm afflicted with Just abs. Think how good you are at two forty five. <laughs> I would be I would be a lot stronger, that's for sure, because you'd be a lot stronger. You'd be a physically impressive human man. Uh, it's just uh, I, I don't know. I, I, abs are now part of the job. I know. I understand. And even even though even though I'm not much of a foodie and, I, and I, I'm fine either way, because, you know, I actually recorded a, a podcast just recently with a buddy of mine who stays super lean year round just to kind of give people a real glimpse into um, what most people would consider almost like OCD level type of food. And that's, that's what it comes down to. Now I don't, I don't have an eating disorder and I, and I, by my own standards, I say, I wouldn't say that. I'm, oh, that's bullshit. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm serious. 
I'm, I mean, hey, if I have an eating disorder, I'm not aware of it at least. So that's right. uh, most most people. Are. So, but 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 no, practically, <laughs> people with eating disorders aren't aware of the fact they have an eating disorder. Well, okay, let me say this. Practically speaking, the reason why I'm able to stay fairly lean year round is I stay active. But I also, what it comes down to is I eat more or less the same foods in the same quantities every day, and I change things as I want when I finally am over something. But I don't care about variety. Like I've I've basically given up variety and spontaneity for leanness. And that's what that's for control. Yes. And yeah, for you, food is a tool. For me, food is recreation. Exactly. And that's what people need to understand. Uh, even, and there's a, there's a psychological aspect to that to understand. It's fine to understand the mechanics, energy balance, macro balance. Yeah, that's fine. But when it really comes down to it, especially I think today in the Instagram age where you have a lot of people that um, you, there's obviously a lot of drug use that, that is never disclosed and that changes everything uh, depending on what drugs are being taken. But then there's also a lot of people don't realize that lying about your diet is is a, is a thing as well. Where pretending like you uh, eat with reckless abandon but stay super shredded is also a thing. People do that because it makes them I don't know. They think it makes them look cool, right? So to the point where people will pretend like they will set up as if they're going to have this big cheat meal and pretend like oh they're going to eat all this pizza or something and then and then just throw it away after just to <laughs> just to make it look like they have some secret sauce of like oh how the fuck does he eat five thousand calories a day, but stay shredded. Well, one probably doesn't eat 5,000 calories. He doesn't. And then two, <laughs> no. if he, well, does, he doesn't, he does, he's <laughs> exercising six hours a day and he's on a bunch of drugs. And so either way, like you're not getting the whole picture. So that's the, anyways, I, I think people might find that discussion at least helpful. So when they are trying to decide for themselves, like, do you really want, if you want really good abs all year round, yes, you can have that, but you can't have it all. You can't have what a lot of people want from the diet and have the abs. You can stay relatively lean and fit, but there is a point where you just, unless you are super active you have to keep a pretty close uh, eye on on how much how, how many calories you're eating, and you can't quote unquote afford to um, just kind of turn it loose for for days at a time because you will notice a difference, and that's just that's just the reality. But I still think that you'd be a big, handsome, massive, powerful man at two forty five, and I want you to give. That I don't know how powerful I'd be though. I'm not naturally strength. that strong. You adjust your training, get stronger. Yeah. Sure. No, I mean, I've, I've, I've worked at it. It's just my, give it a try. Okay. Just do it for me. My, 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 my genetics though. My genetics, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. No, no, but uh, maybe one day, maybe one day when when uh, I don't, when I don't need the abs so much anymore, it'd be a fun experience. One day when your camera is gone, when you're no longer yeah, taking pictures yeah. of yourself. I think you've got a lot of huge potential that you've, uh, you've left undeveloped for your abs. That's 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 valid because I've gotten fairly strong with abs, so there's something there's something to be said for that. In fact, all righty, sir. Well, thanks again for taking the time, and uh, it's it's fun as always. And you know, I'll reach out and we can get the next one lined up. Okay, thanks for having me, Mike. Hey there, it's Mike again. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it interesting and helpful. And if you did and don't mind doing me a favor, then please do give this video a like and leave a comment down below. Not only do I like to hear from everybody and I jump in and reply to as many comments as I can, it also helps other people find their way to the show and learn how to build their best bodies ever too. And of course, if you want to be notified when the next episode goes live, then just subscribe to my channel and you won't miss out on any of the new content. Lastly, if you didn't like something about the show, then definitely shoot me an email at mike at musclelife.com and share your thoughts on how you think it could be better. I read everything myself and I'm always looking for constructive feedback, so please do reach out. Thanks again for listening to the episode and I hope to hear from you soon. And lastly, this episode is brought to you by me. <laughs> Seriously though, I'm not big on promoting stuff that I don't personally use and believe in, so instead I'm going to just quickly tell you about something of mine. Specifically, my one-on-one -on -one coaching service. So the long story short here is this is the personal coaching service that I wish I had when I started in the gym many years ago. Every diet and training program that we create for clients is 100% custom. We provide daily workout logs and do weekly accountability calls. Our clients get priority email service and discounts on supplements and the list goes on and on. 
Furthermore, my team and I have also worked with hundreds of people of all ages, circumstances, and needs and goals. So no matter how tricky you might think your situation is, I promise you, we can figure out how to get you results. If I have piqued your interest and you want to learn more, then head on over to www.muscleforlife.com forward slash coaching and schedule your free consultation call now. I'll tell you, there's usually a wait list and new slots fill up very quickly. So if you're interested at all, don't wait. Go schedule your call now.